Hi everyone and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. I hope everybody is having a fantastic week so far, staying healthy, staying strong. In this class, we are looking at IELTS listening part one and part two. We will be practicing for that perfect band nine score. I will give you strategies as we move through the questions and the answers. Welcome Moha Mojahid, Shivam, uh, Karthik, Pavan, our members. Good to see you in the class. Shatvara, very nice. Ramnik, good to see so many students here. Uh, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com. For academic IELTS success, visit us there. For the general IELTS, check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of those websites, we have lots of great information to help you improve for your next exam. And you can use the code R4TYJ today to get a 20% uh, discount. Our websites are also powered by apps, Academic IELTS Help, links to ahelp.com, and General IELTS Help links to uh, gieltshelp.com. So definitely download the apps when you have a moment. We will be using the websites today for our listening. This is our Academic IELTS website here with the blue background. You can click this big red button to join our premium package. It's a one-time payment for lifetime access. We are a British Council IELTS Registration Center and certified agents. And for the general IELTS, it's the green background and you can click that big red button there to join our premium package. So make sure to do that, check that out. And to follow us on Instagram, visit IELTS underscore AE help or GLS help in your Instagram account for lots and lots of free goodies and communication to keep up with uh, live lessons and vocabulary. Uh, and of course, tomorrow we will have the second half of this uh, listening test today, uh, parts three and four. And then uh, we will also have some speaking classes on Saturday. So lots and lots of great IELTS learning coming up for you. Uh, right now, let's get into our uh, listening with listening section one. Now, since 2020, they've changed this to part one instead of section one. Uh, this is coming from our uh, very first exam and all of the audio for this is available on our uh, website as well. So we'll get right into it students. I'm just going to hop over to our academic IELTS website here and then I will log into my uh, student account. In my student account I find all of my materials, computer-based practice exams, uh, lots of those. I have a full interactive course that takes uh, about 60 hours to complete. I have workbooks, lesson videos, lots and lots of those. You'll see that. Boom. Over 100 hours of video lessons. Well over 100 hours of video lessons. And then of course underneath that you will find your audio CDs. Exactly. Now uh, because this is test one listening part one. It's our very, very first uh, listening track. So what I'm going to do, students, is I'm going to play the audio for this listening. You will see the questions. Answer the questions uh, in a separate document or on a separate piece of paper. Don't put your answers in the chat. So do not put the answers in the chat uh, just because that's confusing for other students, especially if you have the wrong answer. Uh, so uh, we will go over the questions after we do listening part one together and we will talk strategy. Pavan says, I am ready, happy face. That's fantastic. So I'm playing uh, this audio because it's a live class uh, through my microphone and a nice Bose speaker. But if it's quiet for you, just turn up the volume. If you have a headset, uh, use that. It'll be clearer. Okay. All right. So here we go. 
with uh, listening part one. Now you'll see at the beginning when the instructions are given in the listening, and this is a very important strategy for your official test, I'm going to look at the topics of part two, three, and four just to start and get an idea of what those uh, challenging parts will be about. So focus on what the topics of those parts will be. I will ask you uh, once we answer the questions. So uh, here we go, everyone. This recording is copyrighted by Two Think One Solutions Inc. and World ESL Tutors. You will hear several different recordings and you will answer questions on what you hear. There will be time given to read the instructions and questions and you will be given a chance to check your work. The recordings will be played only once. The test is made up of four sections. At the end of the test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Listening section one. You will hear a conversation between two men as one of the men registers for a football league. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this question will be played. Hello there. I'd like to register for the Autumn Men's Football League. All right. Uh, in what town will you be playing? I'd like to play in Chester, but I'd be willing to travel to Liverpool if I had to. The man says he wants to play in Chester, so B has been indicated for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello there. I'd like to register for the Autumn Men's Football League. All right. Uh, in what town will you be playing? I'd like to play in Chester, but I'd be willing to travel to Liverpool if I had to. Well, we have two spots left open on the team in Chester and five spots open on the team in Liverpool there's a very good chance you would have to try out for the team in Chester. Are you a good player? I consider myself a good player, yes. I have been to a number of the Autumn Men's League games in the past, just as a spectator, and I'm sure I would have no trouble fitting in. OK, good. So we will register you for Chester then. I just need to get some information from you, starting with your position. Where on the field do you prefer to play? I'm a midfielder, although really, I can play anywhere aside from goalkeeper. Oh, I forgot to ask your name. Right, I guess that's important. My name is Steve Tremell. Would you mind spelling Tremell for me? Certainly. Tremell is spelled T-R-A-M-M-E-L-L. -L. Right, now I need your home address, including your postcode. I live in Chester, of course, at 452 King George Avenue. The postcode is MS868P4. MS868P4? Yes, that's right. And your date of birth, sir? The 8th of September, 1986. OK. Now I need your phone number. Just a mobile number will do. I don't have a mobile phone right now, unfortunately. I can give you my girlfriend's number instead. That would be all right, I suppose. Good. Her number is 329-63-3270. Fine. I think that's all the information I need to gather from you. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do have a couple. First, when does the season start? The season starts on the 28th of September, although your first game is later, I think. Let me check the schedule. Yes, your first game is October the 1st in Liverpool. Let me make a copy of the schedule for you. Thank you. Could you also tell me how long each game is? Each game has two halves, 40 minutes each half, so the game is 80 minutes long. That's a little shorter than the other leagues I've played in. Games are usually 90 minutes. Yes, our spring and summer leagues are 90 minute games, but our autumn league has only 80 minute games. I think it has something to do with the poor weather. 
You now have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, can you tell me how many players are on each team? And I mean on the whole team, not just the players on the pitch. Usually there are five additional players to the 11 on the pitch. So there are 16 players on each roster. We generally find that to be the perfect number. It allows for a few players to miss a game, but still allows lots of playing time for each player. Yes. Playing time is what I was worried about. I don't want to pay my money and then sit on the sidelines the whole season. Are there minimum playing time requirements? Yes, each player must play a minimum of half a game, so you are guaranteed at least 40 minutes of playing time per game. Wonderful. That puts my mind at ease. Could you tell me what facility we play at in Chester? That information is on the schedule, along with the addresses of all the other facilities in the league. Here's your schedule. Thank you. Oh good, it states we play two streets from my flat. How convenient. That is very lucky. Do you have any more questions? No, I think that's it. Oh wait, how much does it cost to register? Uh, it's going to be £125 for the season, including all fees. How would you like to pay? I'll be paying cash. Right. Would you like a receipt? Um, if you find that it doesn't work out time-wise, you can always bring the receipt back and we will give it to you. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, always make sure to use that half minute to check your answers. It's very important. Um, while the information is fresh in your mind, you can probably catch... Uh, some uh, mistakes, maybe spelling mistakes or a missing word, perhaps. All right. Um, so again, at the beginning of uh, this uh, speaking with the uh, instructions, there's about one minute of instruction time. When you're doing your official IELTS exam, do, do not just blankly stare at your computer screen uh, during that one minute uh, instruction time, but instead hop to part two, part three, part four, take a quick look at the titles and the topics so that you can start to introduce these to your thinking, to your brain, so that when you get to those more challenging parts, uh, your brain is already engaged in searching for that information in the background, okay? So having said that, um, what was the topic of part two, okay? So this is an important strategy that can easily save you a half a band score, maybe even a band score in the uh, listening section. Again, okay, so strategy, use the instruction uh, time in the listening to investigate the topics of uh, part or parts two, three, and four, okay? And in this case, we did that. Uh, so what were these topics? Sammy says it was Titanic for two, three was something about a project discussion, and four was something about climate change. Carolina agrees. Yeah, so uh, part two was uh, something about the Titanic, which is a famous ship that sank in the early 20th century. Uh, part three was some kind of a group discussion or group project. We could figure that out from the table. And then part four, they gave us the topic. And that's the nice thing about part four is usually the topic is very clear. It's right there for you. Uh, so that was something about climate change, which of course is global warming, greenhouse effect caused by humans and other factors uh, affecting life on earth. So uh, now that you have these in your mind, you're going to be better at answering uh, questions related to um, these topics, okay? All right, so let's go back. Let's take a look at part one and let's answer these questions. Now, just an FYI, 
so materials that are before 2020 for IELTS, they include the example for the listening section. But since 2020, IELTS no longer includes uh, this uh, example question for the listening. So they just go right into uh, questions 1 to 10. So beware of that, okay? All right. Okay, uh, so the first question here is, how many football matches has this man played in this league? Is it 10, 0, or 40 to 50 matches? Okay, so he's registering. Uh, VG says, number one is B. Konica says, one is B, Adrian. <laughs> okay, nice full sentence there. Uh, Ramnik says B. Um, yeah, uh, so B is the correct answer. It was actually a little bit of a tricky one for a first question. How do we know that it's zero? What does the man say in the audio uh, that uh, tells us he has not actually played in this league? Uh, can anybody tell me that? So whenever you're practicing for the listening section, it's good to get the right answer. And it's even better to be able to explain why that's the answer. Okay, so Artis says because he's played in other leagues. Yeah, so he does say that. So he says, I've played in other leagues or I've played other games. Um, and Debrock says he was just as a spectator. Okay, so he's watched a number of matches. Yeah, so he's only been in the audience, right? He's been a spectator, but not actually actively playing in the league. Yeah, so... The answer is zero. And again, it's very important to be able to answer why you get a certain response, especially if you're going for those higher band scores. Uh, what position does the man play? So uh, there's midfield, goalkeeper, striker. Uh, so the man says, I'm a... Uh, Lily says, number two is A. The man says that uh, he is a midfielder. Yeah, absolutely. So he very clearly says that. He says, I'm a midfielder. Um, which other position can he play, B or C? So goalkeeper or striker? Uh, which other position can the man play? Goalkeeper or striker? And here, what I'm doing is I'm testing your active listening because he does mention it, okay? So Ramnik says he can also be a striker. Yeah, that makes sense because, of course, goalkeeper is a very different position. So the goalkeeper uses their hands in football much more. So logically, uh, the other possible answer is striker. So he says, I'm a midfielder, um, but I can play any other position except for uh, goalkeeper, right? So that's what he says. So... Striker is the correct answer uh, to my question. So then why is midfielder the right answer? If striker is a possible answer, okay? So if this is a possible answer, why is midfielder the correct answer? So why will IELTS not take striker as a second correct answer? Okay, that's a, it's a valid argument. So a student might say, hey, wait a second. I think striker should also be correct. Um, why, is, why is that not correct then? So why is only A correct in this case? It's a very important question. And I'm wondering if somebody can pick this up. Okay, so even though two answers may be correct, IELTS will only take one in this case. Why? Okay, why? Let's see if somebody's got that because it's, a, it's a, I'm not looking for anything too tricky here. Okay, uh, Frederick says because he says it's his favorite position. Um, because he says he prefers to play midfielder. Yeah, those are um, some good thoughts, Frederick and Nick Hill. Um, the simple answer to my question is because you must choose the best answer in multiple choice questions 
on the aisles. Okay, so typically the difference between high school and college level multiple choice question exams is in high school there is usually just one right answer. In college there can be multiple correct answers but you choose the best one. Okay, so IELTS is the same. And TOEFL as well. Okay, so for those of you who might be uh, looking to take TOEFL, so uh, don't be surprised, and that's why you have to be patient. So the first answer that you hear might not actually be the best answer, so be very, very careful. You're always listening for the best answer for these multiple choice questions. Same in the reading. Uh, for those of you who have thought about taking TOEFL, uh, TOEFL is even more uh, or even trickier uh, in this case. So TOEFL will often have two, three correct answers and one best answer. So uh, IELTS is not as challenging as TOEFL in this case. TOEFL will have even more uh, correct answers and one best answer. So keep that in mind. Okay. Um, and definitely that's the way the world works. Okay. In the real world, there are often multiple scenarios that could be correct, but we're looking always for the best possible situation. So college and university exams will reflect this accurately. Uh, so will the IELTS exam. All right. Keep that in mind. Okay. So uh, yeah, he's a midfielder. He likes to play midfield. That's the best answer. All right. Okay. Uh, and then you have this form completion. This is a very typical type of question in the listening section. And again, be patient, especially in part one, because they often will repeat the answers for some of these and spell them. So the first one, number three, is the man's name who is registering for this football league. His first name is Stephen, or Steve, as he says. And what is Steve's family name? Okay, Lily, uh, VG, and uh, Arda, and many of you are saying his name is Tramel, uh, spelt with T R A double M E double L. Tramel, okay? Uh, all capitals are okay, but remember, all capitals are slower to write and it's easier to make spelling mistakes. So sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but it's better to write lowercase uh, when you're listening, if you're doing the paper-based exam, and then make them capital letters when you transfer the answers to your answer sheet so that you don't accidentally make a capitalization error, okay? So Stephen Trammell, and again, they spell it twice. His address is 452 Kings George Avenue, and what is um, Stephen's postcode? So spaces don't count in postcodes or phone numbers. You don't need to worry about that. Arda says it's MS86P4, 868P4, sorry. So MS868P4. And it looks like a few other of our members and uh, students agree. It's MS868P4. Uh, I highly, highly recommend using capital letters for postcodes or uh, social insurance, uh, social identity numbers as well. Capital letters are definitely clear. They match uh, more with numbers as well. So that's usually the way we do it. And Stephen is born September 8th, 1986, which is fine. Uh, Stephen does not have a mobile number, but has uh, another number. It's 329-633-2270. Make sure to listen to these kinds of information. Uh, by the way, for those of you who do have access to our website, um, we have uh, some listening at the very end of the audio um, where, yeah, so let me just show you that on the website. 
And so uh, to help you listen and understand, and if all the audio on our website is British English, or I should say mostly, there's some New Zealand and Australian as well, just like in the official IELTS. Um, so on the website, you have some listening for currency like dollars, pounds, pence, pennies, uh, listening for days of the month, days of the week, the imperial system, okay, like um, uh, pound, gallon, etc., cetera, uh, inches, and uh, you also have metric system, months of the year. So we basically have all of these kinds of listening exercises for you on the website uh, so that you can get really comfortable with that British accent and those. So check those out, okay? It's very, very useful to pick up some points, right? So for those of you who can access our websites and our premium courses, use that, all right? Okay, um, so here we had to, for number five, match the time with the event. Uh, this is called a matching type question. In simple terms, it's basically multiple choice question. So here we had some dates. And here we had question number five, which is Stephen's first match. So it's getting you to think dynamically, okay? So when is Stephen's first match? Uh, VG Arda Lily uh, say D. Harman agrees that it's D. Uh, yeah, so um, D it is. So October uh, 1st, that's right, okay? And um, just as a bonus question to see how many of you are listening actively, even though uh, Stephen's first match will be October 1st, uh, when does the season actually start? So when does this league's football season actually start? Yeah, so Paulo says it starts on a different date. Arda says it's September 28th. Yeah, so this is the season start. But this is his actual uh, first game, so it's not at the start of the season. Very good. Okay, that's your active listening. When you're doing these listening exercises, you should go above and beyond the questions to test your listening skills. And if you're doing listening in groups, a really great exercise is to ask each other questions about the audio. Okay, uh, keep that in mind. Um, and members, now that you have your own group for discussion on Discord, I highly recommend uh, doing that. So meet up with each other, plan a listening exercise, and then um, uh, discuss the listening and ask each other questions, okay? So again, just a tip here, okay? Uh, do listening exercises, or I should say do IELTS. Uh, listening in groups and ask each other questions about the information. And it's a little bit more exciting uh, than just going through one practice exam after the next, okay? Uh, Pavan Deepika, you know what I'm talking about with that Discord group, right? Okay, fantastic. Um, so, Going back to the questions then, you had a little bit of a break. And then uh, you had this little table here that you have to complete. Uh, pay attention to the, the title of the uh, column. So this is the league. It's an autumn uh, league, men's league. Uh, the game length is 80 minutes. So here I would ask you, why is it 80 minutes? Why is it not 90 minutes? So this is the kind of exercise uh, that you could do. Anybody remember what the man says? So why is why are the games in this autumn league 80 minutes and not the usual 90 minutes? Okay. So why is it why is it shorter by uh, 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah. So Dilip says it's because of the climate. Yeah, something to do with the weather, right? Maybe it's really rainy, so uh, games get too long. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and uh, how many players are on the roster? So how many players are on each team? And this one again is clearly stated. Okay. Lily says number two, I think is 16 question mark. Uh, anybody else? What do you think? Okay, Jessica says 16 as well. 
Yeah, so he says uh, five players uh, in addition to the 11 on the pitch, a total of 16 players. All you need here is just 16. You don't need the word players because it's in the column heading, so all you need is the number, okay? Uh, what is the minimum playing time? So how much uh, should each player play in a game? And this is kind of what the man's worried about. He's like, I really want to pay, play. I don't want to just sit on the bench and pay money. So number seven, what's the uh, minimum playing time that this man can expect? Okay, Debrock says 40. Jessica says 40 minutes. Pavan says 40 min. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Frederick says 40 mins. Yeah, 40 min or 40 mins should be okay. You can use the short form, but you definitely need the word minutes. Okay. Clarity is very important in uh, IELTS. So um, they will not just take 40 because they don't know if it's hours, seconds. Okay. I know it sounds kind of funny. To say that, but IELTS says, well, hey, in clear communication, um, you have to express the unit of measure. So if the unit of measure is not given, you have to give it. If the unit of measure is given, so it says minutes playing time, then you don't need to give it. But here it says minimum playing time, so you need to give the unit of measure, okay? Uh, it's kind of tricky, but at the end of the day, that's life, right? I mean, uh, if I tell my friend it takes 30 to get to my house, he's going to be like, well, 30 what? 30 steps, 30 minutes, $30 with a taxi, 30 hours Do I have to cross the country. Um, so how do I know, right? So we have to be clear in our communication. Okay, so keep this in mind, all right? So you must give the unit of measure in your answer in IELTS when it is not included in the question, okay? Alternatively, when it is included in the question, do not give it in your answer okay so remember that for your um, responses okay all right uh, so number eight uh, why does the man say he's lucky so here again don't think about the question think about the statement so here the statement the man says wow that it's really lucky or that's really lucky uh, he's able to find a team to play on. There's a minimum playing time requirement or the playing field is close to where he lives. Uh, Jessica Zhang, Paulo, Nick Hill all say that it is C. Carolina says C. Lily agrees. Yeah, so there is um, a field close to where he lives. It's just, I think, a couple blocks from his house, if I remember correctly. Okay. All right. Very good. All right, let's keep going. So, uh, here, write no more than two words for each answer. Uh, what is the cost of the football league? So how much does the man have to actually pay? Now, notice how here, again, the unit of measure is not given. So you have to include that unit of measure. Okay, so VG says 125 pounds. Arda agrees. And yeah, some of you might not have the symbol on your keyboard. Definitely, if you're doing the computer-based exam, you should be switching to an English, British, QWERTY keyboard setup. Okay, that's really important. And the easiest way to answer this question is to use the symbol pounds and then write 125. So symbols are accepted. You can use them. And it's actually good to use them because they're a lot faster. There's no chance of spelling mistakes as long as you have the right symbol. If you put a dollar sign, Harmon, you will get it wrong because this is dollars, okay? In fact, I think a single line through is Canadian dollars and double line through is US dollars. 
So there are some subtle differences there. But again, the tip here is if you're planning to do the computer-based exam, switch to using a British QWERTY keyboard, okay? Uh, very important. So, and then how does the man pay for the registration fee? So credit card, check, peanuts, um, doing the dishes, or some other way. Uh, Himani says it's cash. Yeah, absolutely. So cash, common noun, you don't need to capitalize. You can use all lowercase letters, cash, okay? So cold, hard cash, all right? Uh, no more than two words, okay? Make sure that you have the right number of words, okay? Don't write a sentence like he wants to pay cash, all right? Okay, great. Uh, how did you do? So what did you get from 10? Okay, always assess yourself, see where you made mistakes. Uh, for part one, ideally, you want to get eh, nine or 10. Okay, if you're getting less than nine, um, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a problem because part two, three, and four are just gonna be much, much more difficult. Uh, so you want to maximize your score in part one for sure, okay? And I can see that many of you did do really well. So Harmon, um, Sammy, Hoang, uh, really good job. Yeah, so nines, excellent, okay? All right, good. Okay, nines and tens. Nines and tens are good. All right, uh, let's uh, go on to section two. So we'll get right into this. Um, we're gonna go nice and smooth here. So it's gonna be part two. Again, I'm going to play the audio through my headset. Uh, please keep your answers in a separate document or in a separate piece of paper so it doesn't confuse other students. Do not put them in the chat. Again, uh, if it's quiet for you, turn up the volume. I am using a headset microphone for this. All right, so let's jump back to the website and then uh, all the way back to CD1. So as you can see, we've got lots of audio on our websites and then track two. Here we go, everyone, with uh, part two listening. Now turn to section two. Take some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listening section two. You will hear a radio presenter interviewing a woman about the infamous ship Titanic. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon to all our listeners and welcome back to History Now, a weekly program that reflects on subjects of historical influence. Today we are going to speak with Dr. Andrea Smithson, an historian at the University of Glasgow. Good afternoon, Andrea. Good afternoon, Peter. What are you going to talk about today, Andrea? I'll be talking about one of the most catastrophic events in maritime history the sinking of the Titanic. I can't wait for you to begin. Thanks, Peter. The Titanic was an enormous ship. The makers called it unsinkable. From end to end, it measured approximately the length of three football pitches. It had the capacity to carry over 3,500 passengers, as well as the over 800 people on the crew of the ship. Despite its massive size and impressive capacity, the Titanic was able to cruise at a speed of 40 knots. This was in large part due to the 59,000 horsepower engine. Just how much is 59,000 HP? Well, in literal terms, it's like being pulled by 59,000 horses. More realistically, it's the equivalent power of 500 cars. On the maiden voyage that left Southampton, England on the 10th of April, 1912, there were 1,343 passengers and 885 crew members. There were three different classes of tickets for those aboard the Titanic. 
A third class ticket was the lowest level ticket. At the time, it cost between three and eight pounds. A second class ticket cost about 12 pounds. A first class ticket cost anywhere from 30 pounds all the way up to 870 pounds. In today's money, 870 pounds is over 20,000 pounds. You may be wondering what the people in the first class were paying for. They had luxurious rooms on the highest decks, delicious meals for breakfast, lunch and dinner, as well as the finest entertainment money could buy. On the other hand, those in third class slept in cramped rooms which were quite plain and small and did not have access to the fine restaurants and entertainment on the upper decks of the ship. Now I'd like to tell you about a few lesser known facts about the Titanic. Although there were four large funnels or smokestacks on the Titanic, only three of them were functional. One of the funnels was put there just to make the ship look even bigger and more impressive. The ship carried over 70 tonnes of food for the passengers, including over 40,000 eggs. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 17 to 20. On the night of the 14th of April 1912, on her maiden voyage, the Titanic hit an iceberg. About three hours later, early morning the next day, the ship sank. The reasons for the sinking are numerous. First, the watertight doors, which were supposed to keep water out, didn't work properly. Second, the night of the 14th of April was incredibly calm on the water. Icebergs are easily spotted when there are waves crashing against them. On this night, there were no waves. The strength of the metal in the Titanic was not as it should have been. The metal became brittle in the freezing cold and was easily broken by the iceberg. Another big factor was the inability of the Titanic to turn quickly. Once the lookouts had spotted the iceberg, the captain ordered the ship turned, but it was too late. If the ship had been able to turn faster, it would have missed the iceberg. One of the biggest tragedies about the sinking was that there were not enough lifeboats for everyone on the ship. In addition to this, many of the lifeboats left the sinking vessel with less than half of the people they were designed to carry. For example, the first lifeboat off the Titanic left with only 27 of the allotted 65 passengers. This unfortunate occurrence can be attributed to panic on the part of the passengers and crew. One can only imagine the sheer terror on board the ship that early morning. 1,523 out of the 2,228 passengers and crew perished that morning. Most died from the near freezing temperature of the Atlantic Ocean. Others drowned after being trapped in the lower decks. 705 people lived to tell their story, most of them women and children who were put on the lifeboats before the grown men were. Because of this, 94% of the first class passenger women and children were saved, while only 14% of the third class passenger men survived. Overall, 60% of the first class occupants survived, while only 25% of the third class ticket holders lived in the aftermath of this tragedy. That is the end of section two. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, and again, check those answers in that time. Okay, let's go through these answers together. Uh, make sure we got the right ones. Um, first one here, what was the overall capacity of the Titanic? Now for this, hint, Hint, you had to do a little bit of math and there's usually at least one of these questions in the IELTS listening. So 800, 3,500 or 4,300. The correct answer here, uh, Ferengiz has it, is uh, 4,300. So 800 passenger, or sorry, 800 crew plus 3,500 passengers 
So the total is uh, 4,300. It's the overall capacity, overall meaning total capacity of the Titanic. Okay, so at most it was able to hold 4,300 people. Okay, so quite a nice big boat for the time. Fortunately, it didn't last very long. Okay, uh, so uh, what was the cost of a third class ticket? Okay, third class ticket was 30 to 850 pounds. Woo, that would be expensive at the time. Between one and two pounds or between three and eight pounds. Number 12. Number 12 was C as well. So between three and eight pounds. Okay, so C is the correct answer. Uh, for this one. Now questions 13 to 15, so it's three questions and you have to get three correct letters or answers. If you get one wrong, you lose one mark. So uh, first class tickets were very expensive and they were paying for some luxuries or some amenities. What were the benefits of a first class ticket? The order here does not matter. So doesn't matter which order you give the answers. It just matters that you give the correct answers. So what were they paying for? Watertight doors, that's kind of silly. Um, let's see, B, C, E, some of you are saying B, D, C. Uh, B, many of you got. Luxurious rooms, definitely. Uh, great entertainment, yeah. So the finest entertainment money can buy. High quality meals, access to casino and lower deck rooms. Uh, it was D. So, of course, they're going to eat really well. They're going to have some fine dining cuisine for those wealthier passengers. So, B, C, and D are uh, good. Lower deck rooms, watertight doors, that doesn't really make sense. So, uh, careful. You can also kind of figure this out by deduction. So, by taking away the wrong answers. Okay, number 16, uh, which of the following is the best representation? So this is kind of like that map style question too, where you have to figure out from the information which diagram is the most accurate. And of course we can see that A has one, two, three, four, five smokestacks. B has four smokestacks. C has three smokestacks. So you really have to just figure out how many smokestacks the Titanic actually had. Um, yeah, it was B, four of them, except one of them didn't really work. It was just put there to make it look even bigger. They should have probably put some more lifeboats there instead. Um, that would have been more logical. Okay, and then we had this kind of question where it was a flow chart. And you probably noticed that the answers didn't come in the exact order of the flow chart. I had a similar question in my official IELTS exam in the computer base. There was a flow chart like this, and then you had to drag and drop the answers in. And I remember that in that question, the answers didn't come in order either. So here you have to look at the whole question all at once and then listen for the right answers. Okay, so be really careful about that. No dear Beck. And Pavan and Arda all agree that number 17 was waves. Waves are countable. It's very important. It is a plural in this case. Uh, extremely calm night. No waves crashed against icebergs. Can't be one wave because there's no way one wave would be crashing against multiple icebergs. Or, well, no, nah, it would stop at the first one. Um, then the Titanic hit the iceberg and the watertight something failed. Uh, what failed? on the boat. So what kind of mechanism wasn't working as it should to keep the water out for number 18? Carolina says doors. The doors failed, also plural. And Carolina is correct, and so is Nick Hill. Doors. Yeah. Paulo. Good. Number 19. Many something left the ship half full. Um, while it has to be some kind of a vehicle, it's a boat, so you at least know it's some kind of a boat. What kind of a boat is it? What kind of a boat left the ship half full? And this is a good word to know in English, especially if you are planning to do some travel by sea, um, because God forbid you need it. 
uh, you want to know this word. Okay, they're called lifeboats. Uh, another word that could potentially save somebody's life, okay, and when you're on open waters, you should always wear one of these. What is this safety device called that you put on when you go water skiing? Um, and uh, so what is, what is this uh, safety device called? Can anybody tell me? These are words that you should absolutely learn in English, okay, because they're internationally used, especially. Uh, Baldish says life jacket and Schluck says life vest. Both are okay, yeah. So they could be either called a life jacket or a life vest. All right. Um, what is this called? So that donut-shaped thing that they can throw at you from the boat. Um, what is that called? Anybody? There's even a candy uh, that you can buy, a popular candy that's got the same name. Just getting trickier and trickier, but again, uh, important to know. Niha says it's a water tube. It's not a water tube. That would Somebody would be throwing you something very different if you asked for a water tube. It's not a tube. It's not a tube vessel, okay? It's called a lifesaver aptly, right? So it's called a lifesaver, lifesaver. Okay, not a tube, lifesaver, all right? And any of these kinds of uh, items that help you to float in water, so lifesaver, okay? Uh, any of these, or life preserver sometimes as well, it's called, okay, lifesaver, life preserver, any of these um, items that help you to float in water. It's called a flotation device. Okay, so remember this collocation, uh, flotation device. Okay, flotation device, All right? God forbid, again, that you ever have to scream for these, but you never know. Lots of people, life is long, okay? All right, um, so number 19, many of the lifeboats. Okay, lifeboats left the ship half full. It's one word, lifeboats, plural, all right? And the very last one, uh, 1,523 people die, most from the freezing cold temperatures of... Okay, lots of students are jumping the gun. Atlantic Ocean has to be a big A. It's the name of the ocean. Atlantic has to be a big O because it's the name of the ocean. So Atlantic Ocean, okay? Those are the correct answers. All right. So uh, how did you do, students? What did you get from 20? How was that? So part one and part two together, what did you get out of 20? Okay. Uh, and again, ideally, uh, if you're going for those higher band scores, your score should be somewhere from 16 to 20. Okay. If you're getting less than 16 in part one and part two together, um, that's bad. So if you're getting less than 16, uh, somewhere here, then that's not very good. Okay, that's bad. And I think it was Pavan that told me that uh, I used the sign incorrectly last time, so I made sure to use it correctly this time, the less than sign. All right. Um, so, uh, hopefully you got more. Okay, Dibarak says 17. That's not bad. Heartbreak. Tanvir says 18. It's good. Okay. Uh, Tian Tang says, I teach so bad. I'm sorry, Tian, that you're not enjoying the lesson. Let me know what I can do better. Send me an email. Uh, all right. Got some great scores. That's fantastic. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, students. So that is it for today's class. But worry not, part three and part four will be coming up uh, tomorrow, okay? So until then, you can check out our websites. Lots more listening there, as you saw. Lots and lots of uh, audio as well as video. Uh, for the Academic IELTS, go to uh, our blue-looking website at Academic IELTS Help, okay? It looks like this. 
you can uh, click this big red button to join the premium package, get access to all of those lesson videos. And uh, for the general IELTS, uh, it's the green background. You can click that big red button to join the premium package there. Uh, again, I will be back tomorrow and we will have more classes on Saturday as well. You can check out the schedule on our YouTube community board. And thank you for joining me today. I hope all of you have a lovely rest of your day. If it's late in your country, get some rest, recharge your batteries. Much love to all of you wherever you are in this beautiful world today. Thank you, Carolina, for moderating the chat, keeping it effective and clean. Uh, thank you, members, for your support, and thank you, viewers, for being here. I'm Adrian, signing out from Canada. Bye for now.